Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Breezy Prep. Did you miss me? Because I truly miss being able to speak with all of you. Where have I been? Well, residency started off with a bang in the form of two weeks of ICU, lots of heart failure, lots of liver failure, a bit of hemon too, so you better believe this lecture is going to come in handy when you reach your dream residency. Uh, so yeah, we're talking to Hemon today. Before we get started, uh, I am excited to announce that tutoring is back open. I've had a number of people reaching out to me, asking me for lessons, and I'm excited to say I can finally honor that request. I have three weekly spots uh, opening today, as of today, July 19th. Um, you know, I have students graduating from step one to step two, from step two to residency, uh, and so spots open from time to time, and now's one of those times. So, if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one tutoring, or you just want to talk strategy, shoot me an email at aaronbrowni9 at gmail.com. I'll throw the link in the description, and you know, we'll meet. 30 minutes, no charge, just you and me talking about how you're going to crush step one, be a big, tough, awesome MD, DO, MBBS, and all the above. Okay? So, uh, without further ado, let's get started with this hematology oncology lecture. Uh, but otherwise, we are going to be cruising right through. There's still time built in for questions, so if you have questions, please do, um, don't hesitate to stop me. Um, and yeah, should be a good session. This is a topic that, you know, can be difficult. A lot of these disorders look similar, if not the same. And so, especially when we get into oncology, uh, you know, let's make sure that every disease, we point out at least one thing that makes it different from the other diseases, okay? And if I don't do that, say, hey, Aaron, can you go back? What makes this one different? Okay, because that's how you're gonna be able to get these questions right. If, if you can pick that one thing, they all look so similar, right? They're fatigued, they have weight loss, they have, you know, non-tender lymphadenopathy, which disorder is it? We got to figure out which one it is. And uh, so we're going to have one thing at least from each disorder to help you pick that out. All right. Great. So let's start off with heme. We're going to talk anemia. We're going to talk platelets and coagulation. And then we're going to talk hypercoagulability. So anemia, what is an anemia? Anemia is really just any time where you lack enough healthy red blood cells to carry oxygen. Okay, this can be a problem with one of the components of the red blood cell, a drop in the numbers of the red blood cell. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways to get to your anemia. And generally, we like to break it down into our microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic anemias. But before we get into that, let's talk about what is actually in the red blood cell. So when we look up close at a red blood cell, what do we see? Well, if we're looking from the outside, what we're going to see is the membrane. The membrane is a, you know, this bilayer uh, phospholipid membrane that we're used to talking about in all the cells of the human body. And interspersed in this membrane are proteins, very, very important proteins. These proteins are going to grab onto things on the outside of the red blood cell, and they're going to grab onto things on the inside of the red blood cell. Okay, so for example, on the inside of the red blood cell, it grabs onto spectrin and anchorin. You can see anchorin uh, is this protein here, large protein that's able to uh, anchor uh, uh, spectrin and, and uh, spectrin alpha and spectrin beta. Okay, and so you know this ends up being a pretty uh, important um, you know structure, right? If we if we lose our anchorin or we lose our spectrin, what might happen to our red blood cells? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We lose that uh, normal uh, sort of um, uh, tube shape to our red blood cell. It becomes very, very round, very spherical, and we can even call that spherocytosis. In spherocytosis, these red blood cells that are now round, that have lost their buoyancy, have difficulty getting through the narrow capillaries, right? When you come to that fork in the road, if you're nice and flexible, you might kind of hit that fork, but then move to, off to one direction, versus if you, know, you lack that flexibility, uh, you might just pop. Okay, so that's an example of something it holds on to. Another thing we can think about is our GPI anchor, okay, that we need in a certain disorder called GPI anchor. It anchors a um, something called a, a um, let's see, a degeneration acceleration factor, decay accelerating factor, DAF. Ringing any bells? 
Nocturnal. Mm -hmm. Paroxysmal. I'll give you that one. That's the one. Hemoglobin urea. Yep. Yep. So uh, again, these cytoskeleton proteins—they, you know, a lot of kind of um, of crossovers here that we could talk about. Okay. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, membrane integrity is what we're talking about here. Next thing that's inside of the red blood cell are, of course, enzymes. And so. A really important fact about red blood cells that gets a little bit glossed over, uh, you know, I think when we're early in medical school, maybe they teach it, but it, it just kind of goes so quick. You're learning so much other stuff. So r red blood cells do not do oxidative phosphorylation, right? They don't do the Krebs cycle, okay? Uh, they, all of that process is gone. Red blood cells are completely dependent on glycolysis and the HMP shunt to generate energy, okay? And not only are they dependent on this glycolysis for uh, energy, they're also dependent on this HMP shunt for something called NADPH, okay? And so if we go over to the diagram here, where's our NADPH? So here's NADPH, okay? And NADPH is going to allow for the generation of something called glutathione. Now, glutathione, it metabolizes uh, reactive oxidative species, keeps hemoglobin in the reduced state. Great. Uh, so why do we care about that? Let's think about uh, the fact that <clears throat> hemoglobin is binding, <clears throat> excuse me, binding and unbinding to a molecule that has four free electrons, okay, to take us back to orgo, right? We've got oxygen, oxygen, boom, boom. And what's hanging out over here? We've got all these free electrons. Okay, and so hemoglobin is binding and binding to that. Inevitably, one of those free electrons is gonna get stuck onto the hemoglobin, okay? If you have a, heme a electron stuck on your hemoglobin, you're not gonna be able to bind a new oxygen molecule. And so that's a big, big problem. So that's where glutathione can come in and snag that extra electron and make it so that hemoglobin can carry oxygen again. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, so what else is inside of the red blood cell? Of course, our hemoglobin. So two alpha and two beta chains. This is the adult hemoglobin. Uh, it carries oxygen. It carries carbon dioxide. And 2,3-BPG is an oxygen modulator. Okay, what is this 2,3-BPG? What is that relevant for? Excellent, oxygen affinity. So when there's a lot of 2,3-BPG around, the hemoglobin is going to be uh, less likely to bind to that oxygen, okay? It essentially makes it so that the hemoglobin will release oxygen, okay? And so in what situations would you have a lot of 2,3-BPG? Well, when you get into the capillaries and it's time to release that oxygen into the tissues. Uh, if you have a situation where the pH is high, Say, you know, you have someone exercising, we get a little bit of lactic acidosis, 2,3-BPG is going to bump up and cause oxygen to be released so that those tissues can revert from anaerobic respiration to aerobic respiration, okay? So 2,3-BPG is, is a modulator of that oxygen affinity curve. More 2,3-BPG around is going to cause a right shift in the oxygen affinity curve, a right shift. 2,3-BPG causes a right shift in the oxygen affinity curve. That is a, um, you know, step question if I ever heard one, okay? They love you to know what happens with that oxygen affinity curve, okay? What might cause a left shift? Let me just make sure because I, you know, I want to make, be really clear about this. So right shift is acidosis, left shift is, um, you know, basically alkalosis, okay? And then you can kind of load on to your 2,3-BPG on top of that, Okay. Uh, excellent. So let's keep moving here. Uh, anemias. When we are evaluating a question about anemias, uh, we're going to broadly break down these into the size of RBCs. Okay. If the RBC is small, we're going to say that's a microcytic anemia. If it's large, we're going to call it macrocytic. And if it's normal, we'll call it normocytic. It's not just the size um, that, that is this um, MCV, it's mean corpuscular volume. And so it's, you know, really how much volume is inside of the red blood cell, but we can say size, it's, it's basically equivalent. Uh, we can say, is this a intrinsic anemia or an extrinsic anemia? Is this an intravascular 
or an extravascular anemia? And what's happening with the reticulocyte count? If you can answer those things, you can figure out what's going on in terms of your anemia. Now, if we see a microcytic anemia, the problem is always hemoglobin synthesis. If, the, if it's a microcytic anemia, the problem is hemoglobin synthesis. Why am I harping on this? Because what STEP is going to do, you're going to sit there and memorize this nice list from USMLE first aid. You're going to say T-A-I-L, tail. That's my microcytic anemias. I'm going to memorize that and move on. I don't think that's a good strategy. I think what you need to learn here is what's really going on, uh, you know, in sort of the pathogenesis of this disorder. And what's happening is there's a problem making hemoglobin, okay? Because what STEP is going to do is they're going to give you some new disorder you've never heard of, and they're going to describe an, an issue with hemoglobin synthesis, and then they're going to ask you what kind of anemia would it be? Okay, they're going to add some imaginary disorder to this list, and then you have to put it on this list, essentially. Okay, describe what microcytic anemia is. Microcytic anemia is a problem with hemoglobin synthesis. Okay, so when we think about thalassemia, here we have a, gen genetic, um, a genetic loss of one of our chains. Uh, anemia of chronic disease, storage of iron. Uh, prevents us from using that iron to create hemoglobin molecules. Iron deficiency, uh, very similar. Lead poisoning, here we inhibit the process of generating um, a, a hemoglobin molecule, okay? Uh, and so uh, that's essentially, um, you know, microcytic anemia in a nutshell. So let's dive in a little bit. Iron deficiency anemia, what are we looking for? Low level of transferrin. Well, low transferrin, why, why is that? What is this transferrin molecule? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, good. So the transporter for iron is at low levels. That makes sense. If we don't have iron, uh, you know, why would we have lots of transferrin? Okay, but then, I, you know, you, you tell me that, I agree, but then I say here that the TIBC rises. How does that make sense? Mm hmm. These proteins are hungry for iron. OK, um, you know, if you already, you know, you're sort of at homeostasis and then I give you some iron, most of that iron is going to leave, you know, through your urine or stool. Now, if you are someone that is iron deficient and I give you iron, it's going to get gobbled up by serum proteins. OK, they are ready for it. OK, they are there for that. And so expect to see a rise in TIBC and iron deficiency anemia. And, you know, what, what's going to happen is they're going to try and get you to compare and contrast with uh, the, uh, well, I wasn't going to say sideroblastic. I was going to say anemia of chronic disease, but it's, there's no slide on that. So we'll, just, we'll come back to that later. Uh, so sideroblastic anemia. Here, you know, we can have genetic causes. We can have alcohol as a cause, lead, B6 deficiency, copper deficiency drugs like isoniazid, lin linezolid. Here, the issue is defective iron incorporation into heme. We talked about uh, lead poisoning earlier. You can't get the iron into the heme. And so um, here's, you know, sort of that the way that anemia presents. What do we look for? Two things. One is basophilic stippling and two is ringed sideroblasts. Okay, so uh, what's the difference? I mean, I feel like these words constantly get thrown around. How do you know if it's a basophilic stippling or if it's a ringed sideroblast? <laughs> I had no idea too. There, there's one small thing that will give you that answer. And that small thing is where did the slide that you're looking at come from? Basophilic stippling happens in the periphery. Ringed sideroblasts happen in the bone marrow. OK, so if you are looking at a slide like this and I'm sure you're comfortable kind of uh, being able to look at a slide and knowing it's a peripheral blood smear. Right. It has this typical very light background. The red blood cells, they might look a little more red than this. Um, but compare that to a bone marrow sample. Usually you see lots of different types of cells, uh, sort of a darker, pinker staining. Um, you know, if they didn't tell you where the slide was from, you could probably figure it out just by, by kind of looking for the common features. But in any case, uh, basophilic stippling, periphery, ring sideroblasts in the bone marrow. Okay. 
No, they're, they are different. So here with the ring sideroblast, this is iron inside of the mitochondria. Um, and so, you know, the iron sort of accumulate in the mitochondria and give it this appearance. The basophilic stippling, uh, this is this is tough. Uh, I'm, have, I'm you know trying to jog my memory here what exactly basophilic stippling is. I want to say it has to do with um, the uh, synthesis of nucleotides, but I, I don't really remember exactly, Christian, what basophilic stippling is. Um, I should know that because it could be on your test, but um, but ring sideroblasts, that's mitochondria, I can tell you for sure. Basophilic stippling, it's like I know this, but I can't remember just off the top of my head. Okay. Um, uh, so iron studies, we're looking for elevated iron because the body's not using it. A drop in TIBC, probably, although it could be normal, and an increase in ferritin because we're really kind of storing away all that iron. Treatment, we can give pyridoxine. Um, this is a cofactor for ALA synthase, and it will kind of um, give a little oomph to getting that heme synthesis underway. And you can see uh, here is the sort of process of generating heme. Um, there's a number of steps here, and I'm sure you've seen this diagram many, many times before and uh, maybe agonized a little bit over memorizing it. You certainly will have one question on your step one exam about um, this diagram. Okay, that's a promise. Now, what are they gonna ask you about it? So I'm gonna tell you right now the important things you need to know. Number one, you need to know what are the cofactors you need to create a heme molecule. What are the two basic things you need? You need a glycine, you need a succinyl-CoA. Where does succinyl-CoA come from? Yes, it does. So this gets borrowed out of the Krebs cycle, joins up with the glycine, and you get this ALA. Okay, great. So what's the next thing you need to know? You need to know this ALA dehydratase, um, and it's sort of that the fact that it's blocked by lead. Um, and also know that lead blocks ferrochelatase, which is the last enzyme in this whole process. Okay? And so those are the basic you must know. Now we're going to go into, okay, knowing these will get you extra points. Okay, we're going from like 230s to 240s, 250s by knowing these things. So PBG deaminase, I would say, you know, in order is the next high yield because AIP is more common than these other porphyrias. Okay, acute intermittent porphyria is more common than the uh, porphyria cutanea tarda or the uh, congenital um, whatever, whatever porphyria, this middle one, not very common. Okay, AIP is the most common. So know this PBG deaminase. Okay. Um, and then the next would be PCT would be the next high yield one to know and then CEP you can memorize um, because it's sitting right in there in the middle So you're not gonna forget it. Okay um, Now what else do I want to say about this? I want to say that when I um, Was taking a U world self-assessment. I got a question which was uh, this diagram Unlabeled right no labels just a b c d and it asked me to uh, identify where the enzyme deficiency that causes AIP is. Okay, that's tough. That is very difficult. Um, and uh, and I, I don't even remember if I got that one right, but I'm never gonna forget it because, you know, that, that was a difficult question. So um, I do think it's worthwhile to spend a little time with this diagram. All right, good. All right, next are uh, thalassemias. We're gonna start with our alpha thalassemias. In alpha thal, we have four alpha genes. Really, when we talk about thalassemias, just to give you kind of the kind of the, the groundwork background, when we talk about thalassemias, the issue is we've had a mutation in one of the two hemoglobin molecules, okay, that limits our ability to make adult hemoglobin. That's a thalassemia in the nutshell. Whether you're talking about alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia, that's all it is. We have a mutation that limits our ability to make either the alpha chain or the beta chain. Okay, that's all that thalassemia is. Now we can get into the different kinds. So you have four genes for your alpha chain. Okay, and these are all redundant. They all say the exact same things. We just have four copies of them. For your beta genes, you only get two. You get one from mama and you get one from papa. That's it, okay? And so you can see already that 
in terms of your alpha thalassemias, a single gene loss is not going to affect a patient in the same way that a single gene loss would affect a, uh, in a patient that has beta thalassemia, right? With, with this, you've lost maybe 25% of your overall hemoglobin. Here, you've lost half, okay? So great. So what can we say about these different disorders? What are they going to ask you about? I think this is a very straightforward topic. People make it way more complicated than it needs to be. For right? This is four genes. You're good. Three, you're okay, but you can pass it on to your kids. And then when you get into this alpha thalassemia trait, it's called trait because you're starting to kind of uh, show the symptoms of alpha thalassemia. And that makes sense. I mean, we've lost half of our hemoglobin at this point, right? So what can they ask you about here? It's important that someone that has this alpha thalassemia trait, if they, you know, uh, sort of have a progeny that they, um, you know, what is that progeny going to look like? If, for example, if you have someone that has this cis mutations, then no matter what, their kid are going to have alpha thalassemia trait, no matter what. Okay. If you had someone with the trans, then it's possible that you can end up with the silent thalassemia. Okay. It can go on to that. Okay. Uh, if you lose three um, chains, that's just way too many to lose. This is HBH disease, severe hemolytic anemia, and four genes. This is HB Bart. This is deadly in utero. Okay. All you're going to see is a gamma tetramer. Gamma. Okay. So that means that when we have a fetus, that fetus has an alpha chain and it must be a gamma chain. I don't know what gamma looks like. I think it's something like this. Okay. So an alpha chain and a gamma chain, what do we call this? You put those two together. Mm-hmm. that's going to be fetal hemoglobin hbf good okay so if you have a patient with a four gene deletion all you're going to have is a bunch of gammas hanging out together that's called uh hb bart and uh, you get a gamma tetramer okay great beta thalassemias here again we only have two genes if you lose one you're already going to start to show issues okay so a point mutation in a splice site or promoter sequence gives you a reduction in beta globin synthesis prevalent in mediterranean populations uh, beta thal minor here we're a heterozygote the beta chain is underproduced asymptomatic diagnosis confirmed by this is supposed to say hba2 I'm not sure why it looks like that hba2 greater than 3.53%, okay? Um, so HbA2, just to kind of take a step back, we said that adults' hemoglobin is two alpha chains and two beta chains, okay? Fetal hemoglobin would be two alpha chains and two gamma chains. I almost wrote an F. Okay, and so that's this is HbA, Ba, this is HbF, the last one that we can talk about is this HBA2, which is two alpha and two delta chains. Okay. And so this is kind of like our, you can almost think of it as like a backup, um, as a backup hemoglobin. So whenever you have a patient with thalassemia, uh, sickle cell anemia, even you may see elevations in their delta um, chains, which is represented by the HBA2 count. Normally for adults, it's less than 1%. Okay, great. So beta thal major. Here we're a homozygote, meaning there's no good beta chains. So here we're gonna have a severe microcytic hypochromic anemia with the you know with the patient requiring blood transfusions. This can lead to secondary hemochromatosis. Not good. Um, uh, extra medullary hematopoiesis, splenomegaly, increased risk of parvo aplastic crisis. Not good. Not good. Now. Um, they, they, what they'll say in the books is that these patients don't really present until they're, you know, five, six months. They don't, uh, right at birth, you don't know that they have beta thalassemia, which is weird, right? Because when we talk about alpha thalassemia, if you have no alpha chains, that's death in utero. But for beta thalassemia, if you have no beta chains, you can live until four or five months before anyone even realizes. Why might that be? Good. The fetal hemoglobin is making up that difference. So that fetal hemoglobin, remember red blood cells, 
Um, they have a lifespan of 120 days, that's four months. That is long enough to kind of cover this baby in that early time um, while the baby starts kind of hematopoiesis. Eventually, hematopoiesis is not going to be able to happen, and that's when um, you're going to start to see issues. Okay, so, yep, transfusion dependent. Here's sort of our uh, chipmunk faces and whatnot. Great. And uh, just to kind of compare the two, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I, I uploaded this for you. I'm going to upload it as soon as we finish our lecture here, okay? Unless, do you want me to upload it now? Okay, no problem. No problem. Uh, great. So now we move into our normocytic. When it's normocytic, it's a reduction of red blood cells due to reduction in synthesis of red blood cells or increased destruction. Okay. Now, just to do a little bit of teach back, what did we say is the problem in microcytic anemia? That's it. That's it. So, Anemia of chronic disease, this can qualify, you know, we did put it under microcytic, it can be normocytic as well. And so here we find this slide, which I expected to be in microcytic, it can be normocytic as well. That's fine. Uh, so hepcidin, this is an acute phase reaction, this causes hiding of the iron. Um, iron studies, what we see for iron, TIBC, transferrin saturation, all are going to be low because the iron is sequestered. Okay, it's being stored but not properly transferred. The treatment, you just got to treat the underlying cause. Okay, not much you can do. Uh, transfusions are really just a temporizing measure and long term, it's not going to benefit your patient. Okay, great. Aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is a complete bone marrow failure. Okay, so drugs, viruses, chemicals, immune. Okay, you have been kind of killing it today, Christian, so I'm going to take it up a notch. What is a drug where you're going to be worried about bone marrow failure? Or uh, I can say, what's a drug where if you put your patient on this drug, you need to do white blood cell count at a regular frequency? It's, uh, we can think about psych drugs, I think is the safe one to go for. Psych drug, you can do a psych drug, or there's an uh, anti-epileptic drug you can go for. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. You know, I, I have made it a little bit tougher. So the two that I want you to know uh, that cause a reduction in your white blood cell count. Carbamazepine. You knew that. I know you did. And you knew this one too, the one that causes a white uh, a drop in your white blood cell count that's a psych drug is called clozapine. Okay. And just think, you know, like when we were kids uh, and uh, we didn't want to go to school, uh, we were feeling sick, we would, might take, you know, a bag of chips into the closet and just, you know, chow down on those chips. And so, you know, dropping white blood cell count, you're going to eat carbs in the closet. All right, I just came up with that. So no judgment. Uh, so what can we do here? Uh, growth factors, EPO, GM, CSF, uh, bone marrow transplant is probably what you'll have to go for. Um, and this picture, I'm sure you've seen this picture before. Expect to see this picture many, many times again. They want you to know that this is bone marrow that um, has basically all the cells have been just been replaced with fat cells. Okay, um, these sort of clear hypocellular area. PNH, which you told me about earlier. Uh, the issue here is we get impaired synthesis of the GPI anchor for decay accelerating factor, aka CD55. And, you know, just to kind of bring us back to the beginning here, I have to show you CD55 uh, is actually kind of shown here. And so, you know, we, the whole time we were talking about the same thing. Uh, so what does CD55 do? It protects the red blood cell from complement. It, essentially, whenever complement comes around, tries to destroy the red blood cell, CD55 will stop that cascade from happening. If you lose that, complement can destroy your red blood cells. When is complement active? Complement is active when there's a low blood pH. When is there a low blood pH? Well, when you sleep, you stop breathing so rapidly. Your respiratory rate goes down. When your respiratory rate goes down, carbon dioxide starts to accumulate just a little bit, okay? Not enough to make you 
acidotic, but just a little bit of acidosis. And that acidosis is going to trigger that complement to start attacking things. Okay. And so if you've ever wondered why, why is this a nocturnal thing, you know, um, that's the reason is because oh, when you sleep, your respiratory rate falls. When your respiratory rate falls, the PCO2 in your blood inches up just enough to get complement to be active. Red blood cells are a great target. They don't have their DAF. And so they end up getting destroyed. Your patient wakes up um, in the morning and, and uh, you know, has some like red or coat colored urine, comes in to see you and you already know the diagnosis. Okay. So how do we test for this? Uh, there's a sucrose lysis test, a ham test. Uh, increase the pH will render the uh, RBC susceptible complement lysis. This is a typo. It should be say decrease the pH. Okay. Great. So PNH, uh, we kind of talked about what happens here. Good. Uh, excellent. So uh, hemolytic anemias, um, there's many different types of hemolytic anemias. Um, and, you know, they're kind of fun to talk about, quite honestly. I do like talking about hemolytic anemias. So, um, you know, there's a couple different ways to break them down. We can talk about intrinsic abnormality versus extrinsic abnormality. So we can think about, you know, um, if you have something like an acquired membrane defect in PNH, okay, that's intrinsic versus something that's acquired, like a mechanical destruction. Say your red blood cell is trying to make its way by a stenosed aortic valve, okay? That's gonna rupture the red blood cell, um, and ultimately that represents a form of hemolytic anemia. Infection, malaria, antibodies, uh, think about the Coombs test, think about your, your pregnant mom who's, uh, you know, RH uh, negative, and uh, the baby's RH positive, and we have those, red, those antibodies crossing the placenta, okay? Uh, these are the types of things um, that are extrinsic. Now, the fun thing is to talk about intravascular versus extravascular, because this is actually really straightforward. Um, you know, the people that write the step exams, they think it's confusing, but it's actually not confusing at all, right? So tell me about what is intravascular versus extravascular? So, so essentially, rather than think of, a, of examples, let's think big picture here, okay? Intravascular versus extravascular. When I say intravascular, what am I saying? So that is intrinsic, and I went a little fast, and that might make it a little confusing. So intrinsic is something wrong with the red blood cell itself, okay? Good, good, excellent. Yeah, that's all I was looking for. It's just that, you know, in intravascular, this is happening in the capillaries, this is happening distally. Uh, extravascular is in those, in the spleen and liver. Excellent. And I went kind of fast. That was on me. That was on me. Um, so good. Those are kind of our different ways of thinking about those uh, different disorders. So hereditary spherocytosis, this we would probably think of as an intrinsic type of hemolytic anemia because it's you know a deficiency of those spectrum proteins uh and so what we see you can look for spherocytes um you know which we're probably pretty comfortable with pointing out on a peripheral smear at this point uh, the treatment here is a duosplenectomy and uh, no spleen prevents destruction of rigid rbcs because a lot of the destruction is going to be extravascular okay you're going to have an intravascular and an extravascular component with this particular disorder. Okay, and so um, here's a little red, uh, spherocyte. Okay, it looks like a Skittle. Uh, and in order to test for your, um, for this disorder, uh, what you wanna test is how distensible is your red blood cell? Does your red blood cell take on water easily? Or is it flexible? Or it, does it you know, burst as soon as you introduce it? to a, uh, you know, hypoosmotic medium, okay? If the medium is hypoosmotic, remember that water follows salt, so water's gonna rush into your red blood cell and burst it, okay? That's all that this is testing, is how hypoosmotic can we get the fluid around a red blood cell before it pops, okay? If it's a normal red blood cell, it can, you know, handle a decent amount of hypoosmolar fluid. If it is not distensible, it's gonna pop as soon as the fluid gets um, even the slightest bit hypotonic. And so let's see what that looks like. So for our normal patient, well, 
first thing we always do is to look at the axes, right? Every question you get, look at the axes first. So here we're talking about sodium concentration from a low concentration to a higher concentration. And then here on the y-axis, we're saying 0% of our red blood cells have burst. And here, all of our red blood cells are dead, okay? So we're going from a uh, hypotonic to hypertonic, and we're going from 0 to 100. So if we're going 0 to 100, I want to go this way, okay? So I'm going to look at the graph in this way. And let's look at normal first. We can see at 0.5 of osmolarity, uh, we have, you know, red blood cells start to rupture. As we get down to, uh, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, we get about 100% uh, rupture. With our spherocytosis, those red blood cells, they're very rigid. Okay, they don't have the anchorin, they don't have the spectrin, they are just kind of, um, you know, very, very tense. Okay, and so as soon as water starts rushing into those red blood cells, they're going to start popping. Okay, and so that's what we see, is that a more hypotonic um, medium, we see rupture of red blood cells. Okay, questions on this? No? Very good. Okay, so uh, we'll do one question here. Child is brought to the pediatrician because her parents are concerned about the lead poisoning since their house is known to contain lead-based paint. That sounds like a problem. So, uh, complete blood cell count reveals anemia. Lead poisoning causes anemia because it does which of the following. Disrupts heme synthesis by causing decreased iron absorption from the gut. Disrupts heme synthesis by increasing activity of amylonylavonate dehydratase. Uh, disrupts heme synthesis by inhibiting ferrochelatase. That sounds pretty good. Uh, disrupts hemoglobin function by binding to hemoglobin with high affinity, preventing oxygen binding. Disrupts red blood cell DNA synthesis, causing megaloblastic changes in red blood cells. See, I agree. So lead is going to inhibit ferrochelatase and one other enzyme. Yeah, ALA synthase sounds right. Let's go back to that slide just to confirm. Okay, sometimes I have to confirm because these things all run together. Nope, it's dehydratase. I put that in your mouth though because you, you, you said ALA and I said synthase, right? So dehydratase is our enzyme, not the synthase. We got to remember it's the second step, not the first one. Um, and so that's, that's, that's blocked by lead as well. Excellent. And, yep. Sorry? Well, let's go. Let's go back to that question. Let's see. Sorry, this thing's acting up. Okay, so uh, two right answers. What is my other right answer? That yeah, I think that that's that's the opposite one. Uh, interesting. Uh, disrupts red blood cell DNA synthesis, causing megaloblastic changes in red blood cells. This is the a pathogenesis for. Uh, megaloblastic anemia, but not due to lead, right? What causes this? Mm. Yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Folate, B12, pernicious anemia, and then we've kind of got our whole differential there. Excellent. Okay, and so there's another question for you and another one for you to go back and do later when we're not trying to beat the world record. Uh, so autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, here we have uh, essentially our own immune system is attacking our red blood cells, okay? We're going to break this into two big categories. We're going to say warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and we're going to say cold, okay? Warm extravascular happening in the spleen and kidney, spleen and liver, uh, cold happening in either, you know, in the vessels or in the spleen and liver. Okay, it can happen in either places. Now, for warm, the way that I always remember this is warm is like the middle of the body is more warm versus the, you know, capillaries kind of cold. Um, however you like to remember it, just make sure you're clear where these are happening. So what causes them? You're going to see this mostly in the context of lupus. There's other stuff listed here, but most questions you're going to see um, some sort of reference to lupus, uh, you know, butterfly rash or something like that. They're going to give you, uh, and you'll know it's lupus, and then, you know, it's got to be a warm type of hemolysis, okay? Now, when we talk about intravascular 
versus extravascular. The important um, sort of lab finding that we look at is something called haptoglobin. Okay, so what is haptoglobin? Is that just another kind of hemoglobin or what's the story with haptoglobin? <laughs> yes. Good, yes. Haptoglobin, all it, all it is is kind of a chaperone for all of that free hemoglobin before the hemoglobin gets turned into biliveridin, gets turned into bilirubin, gets conjugated, and then gets excreted through the bile. That is the life cycle. Um, before all that happens, haptoglobin binds onto it to kind of um, prevent it from precipitating in the bloodstream. So uh, like you said, intravascular, you're going to see a drop in hemoglobin, uh, <laughs> drop in haptoglobin, excuse me. And in extravascular, you should not see changes in haptoglobin. Okay, uh, great. So what else can we say here? In the cold, it tends to be associated with upper respiratory tract infections, um, autoantibodies, and you know this is an IgM. So remember, IgMs come in pentamers. Sometimes they like to ask about that. When your uh, plasma cells are making IgMs, this is the way that IgMs get made. Versus when your um, when your cells make IgGs, they are um, dimers. Okay, dimers are IgGs. Dimer meaning one, two antibodies, and IgMs are made as pentamers. Okay, the only other way you can really see IgM is on the outside of cells, um, just getting ready to bind onto something. Okay, so maybe you have a macrophage with an IgM on the outside of it. Okay, great. So other types of hemolytic anemia are microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So what causes this? Important ones to know. TTP, as we mentioned earlier, and HUS. TTP, HUS, they are similar in that they are both intravascular. They both cause, you know, hematuria. Um, you know, these patients usually typically look quite sick. They both have schistocytes. They both have elevated D-dimers. The big difference, and this is going to get you points on step one, step two, and maybe a point on and a half on step three, is that in TTP, you also have altered mental status. Altered mental status. That is the differentiating factor between TTP and HUS. Okay? Of course, we can talk about the etiology. HUS is from E. coli, 0157H7. TTP is from a lack of Adams TS13. Okay, so the etiology is different, yes, but if they're not giving you the etiology, you have to rely on your, the clinical exam, and this is what's going to, you know, going to help you score on this question, is seeing that altered mental status, which you do not see in HUS. Other things that can cause a hemolytic anemia, of course, malaria, babesia, parasitic organisms living inside of our red blood cells. They divide, multiply, and uh, destroy the red blood cells. Okay. Great. Uh, moving on to G6PD, here we have an enzyme deficiency. Uh, it's an X-linked. I think that's an important thing to remember, X-linked. And so you look for this um, typically more in males than females, okay? Because females will have that extra X chromosome to cover up any deficiencies in the other X chromosome, okay? Whereas males, we're kind of stuck with the one uh, X chromosome we get, for better or for worse, and um, sometimes for worse. And so what's happening here? Uh, we talked about how important NADPH is. NADPH allows us to make glutathione, okay? Uh, lack of G6PD means the HMP shunt does not work. It means we can't make NADPH. It means if we get a hemoglobin uh, that happens to have an extra electron attached to it, free radical, right? Um, if we happen to have that, that hemoglobin is stuck like that forever. That hemoglobin cannot contribute to 
um, binding oxygen, getting rid of carbon dioxide it is, is, is bump, okay? Not useful anymore, okay? So that's a one thing. Number two, it's just going to kind of uh, ruin the party, okay? So these uh, hemoglobins that are um, oxidized are going to start to clump up. And as they clump up inside of the cells, you can see them as these Heinz bodies inside of our red blood cells. Okay, and so these Heinz bodies, as the as the red blood cell crosses through the spleen, the spleen will take a bite out of those out of it to try and remove the Heinz body, and that's where we get these bite cells. Um, but uh, yeah, so that that's sort of our basics here: normocytic, normochromic. Uh, what can cause it? Some sort of oxidative stress, fava beans, um, and this this is sort of thought to be a um, you know sort of a genetic protection against malaria. Because, um, you know, if you're sort of uh, intermittently destroying all of your red blood cells, um, that's going to cause you to um, also get rid of that, those malaria. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, and so we talked about some of our abnormal hemoglobins. We're going to get into some of the polymerization that we can see, crystallization that we can see with HBS and HBC. So starting with sickle cell anemia, here we have a mutation in the beta chain. This is uh, the famous E6V mutation. Okay, this mutation has been identified for many, many years, at least 30 or 40 years. And what has been done to cure this? Nothing, okay, because it, it, you know, it doesn't affect the right kind of people, okay, at the end of the day. Like, you know, you look at... Um, um, I don't like want to compare disorders kind of messed up, but something like sickle cell fibrosis, like they have put so much attention into curing that and like genetic studies and sickle cell anemia, you know, it's kind of sitting here like, Hey, you know, we have, we already know the mutation. You guys can, you know, hop in any time with your CRISPR, <laughs> but anyway, um, off of my soapbox. So, um, there's the trait form where we get one abnormal and then there's the disease form. Remember, we only get two beta chains. Okay. And so, um, you know, even just having one mutation is already going to start to show some issues. And what sort of issues do we see? So vaso occlusion, um, these are really the main um, signs and symptoms. These can happen every, anywhere. When they happen in the fingers, they're incredibly painful. Uh, when they happen in the lungs, they can present as almost like a pulmonary embolism type picture, but very, very painful in the lungs. It's called acute chest syndrome. Um, pyelonephritis, um, you know, uh, papillary necrosis, these, these very, very um, uh, painful presentations is what you will see. And so what can we do about this? We said that, you know, the beta chain, we don't really want to be making beta chain, to be honest, because um, we can make as much beta chain as you want. The issue is that the beta chain that we make causes problems. And so what we do is we give hydroxyurea. And hydroxyurea is going to help our patient to make more fetal hemoglobin. Okay, and so that's kind of like a, a nice temporizing measure because fetal hemoglobin, um, while it's not the same as adult hemoglobin, it, it actually has greater affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin. It still will carry oxygen, um, you know, to the tissues, which is what we want. Okay. Great. So um, it's important to know that parvo can really... Um, Undermine your patient's recovery here. Very, very bad for your patient to get parvo. Okay. Um, so how do we diagnose this hemoglobin electrophoresis? Um, we can look at the proteins themselves. We can take the protein, put it on an agar plate, connect an electrode to one side, an electrode to the other, and that protein will move. Okay. Now, how far that protein moves depends on how big and clunky that protein is. If it's a small, tight, nicely made protein like our HBA, with two alpha and two beta chains, that thing is gonna move nice and far along that agar plate, okay? Now, if it's a kind of clunky, not quite right hemoglobin, like a sickle cell type hemoglobin, that is not gonna move as far on the agar plate, okay? So what am I even talking about with this agar plate? Let's look at an example. HBC, very similar to HBS, except you get these crystallizations, okay? And these don't move far on the agar plate either. So what am I talking about agar plate? Uh, so hemoglobin electrophoresis, um, the way that this works, and this is a picture out of your first aid book, you take a protein, 
you slap it here on the agar plate and then you connect it to a negative charge on the back side, a positive charge on the front side, and that negative charge, proteins are very, very negatively charged, right? And so it's gonna move away from the negative and towards the positive, okay? So if it's a nicely formed um, double alpha, uh, double, excuse me, double A type hemoglobin, it's gonna move nice and far, okay? And we can see one um, trait from mom, we see one trait from dad, we're good. Okay, we're, we're covered. This is normal hemoglobin. If we look at something like a normal newborn, okay, here we have some fetal, we have some um, alpha chain. And so what we see is two strips here. Okay, now with our sickle cell trait, that, that those sickle hemoglobin are not making it as far. With sickle cell trait, we have some normal and some abnormal. So you do see some normal, but some of that abnormal is not even making it as far as the fetal hemoglobin. When it's sickle cell disease, of course, we're gonna have sort of a thicker double strip representing two abnormal traits. HBC is the biggest and clunkiest of all, does not even get halfway down the agar plate. HBC, we see a nice th double thick line. And then HBSC disease, if you're especially unlucky, uh, you'll have a, uh, a line on each of those, okay? Great. So. You know, it'd be nice if on first uh, on step one they show you a picture from first aid, but they are probably going to show you something closer to this, okay? And so here we have our negative anode here. We have our positive cathode up top. So all of these strips started down here, and they made their way to the top. And so let's just go through a couple of these. If we're looking at um, well three here, what is your um, diagnosis, doctor? What type of... Um, pathology or just normal physiology would this represent? Okay, that's a good guess. We got two lines, um, one, one potentially representing sickle cell trait, one rep potentially representing uh, the uh, normal. However, remember that there's also a fetal hemoglobin type. Um, and so when you see two lines very, very close to one another, and I know I'm being kind of um, not specific here, but when you see, you know, when you get a, an agar well like this, it's good to label everything, right? And so we know that this furthest one is definitely our HBA. So the next one down has to be HBF that they show us, okay? And then... Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It, it, it's tough. I mean, you know, it's kind of subject to interpretation, a little bit of an art here. But, um, but yeah, so this is going to be the fetal. This is the adult. This would be our sickle. And then this one way down here is going to be our HBC, which barely makes it. Or sorry, HBA2, I guess, not HBC. We don't have an example of HBC. Okay, but this is our, your sickle. Good. Okay. HBS, HBC, good. All right, so um, when I upload this for you, I think this could be a helpful kind of exercise. We're not going to do it together now, but um, when you do get a hold of this lecture, uh, you know, see if you can kind of work your way through this diagram with the way that things are supposed to run. For example, iron deficiency, this is a microcytic, so MCV would be down. Iron, of course, would be low, ferritin low, TIBC high, transferrin uh, high. Uh, does that make sense? No, that doesn't, that transferrin is high. Shouldn't it be low if it's iron deficiency? Oh, 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 what I, yeah, I mean, of course, what I say makes sense, but that, this arrow seems incorrect. Um, I mean, maybe we can follow up on that. Transferrin saturation is down. Okay, so I guess the transferrin count goes up with the saturation down. I'm not sure about that one, but yeah, so you get the picture, you can kind of work, work your way through these. Great. So right here, uh, Christian, we're going to take a five-minute break, and we'll come back and do our megaloblastic anemia. Okay, we'll come back at... Um... Well, I do hope that you enjoyed this short presentation on hematology oncology. There's much more where this came from, of course. We talk about megaloblastic anemia, clotting disorders, coag disorders. You name it, we cover it. 
in the rest of this lecture. If you'd like to see more, again, reach out to me, aaronbrownei9 at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to speaking with you. And until we speak, keep working hard, take no days off, and remember, you matter. Thanks.